I don't know if y'all saw behind me this big 330. I mean, I, I know it's easy to miss, right? Super easy to miss. Um, I don't know if y'all know what that means, but it, it, if when you walked in the church, you would have also seen it on our door. Um, so we are beginning a new series, right? And it's all over John 330. For those that don't know what that is, it goes something like this. He must increase and I must decrease. So that's the whole verse. That's it. So it was a very short presentation that I did for y'all today. And so I'm done. So I guess we can go and wrap things up. No. Um, <laughs> so again, we're, we're beginning a series today all over John 3.30. Um, what I thought would be neat because when, when I was approached about this, I was like, well, it's, it's seven words. How do you do four to six weeks on seven words? It's actually pretty easy once you start thinking about it. So I wanted to approach it today from the perspective of uh, kind of some historical insight, if you will, right? Such as, who was John? Who's this guy? And why was it so big that he said, he must increase and I must decrease? So I'd like to kind of give you all some background um, I've made a lot of notes. Now, I don't know if we're going to touch them all. Uh, I, I also wrote a lot of scriptures, so we're going to dig into several pieces of scripture that address John and try to give you some insight as to who he is and, and what this really means. So again, I'm just going to restate this. He must increase, but I must decrease. So for me, I would say that this is one of the most commonly known pieces of scripture. Um, a, I see it quoted often. It's spoken of all the time. It's written on shirts. I've seen it on bumper stickers. Uh, I see it all over. I mean, it's, again, as I stated, it's even on our front door. So, I mean, it's, it's right there. So it's all over the place. You see it all the time. So, again, we're embarking on a series that's all about this one piece of Scripture. Seven words. Just seven words. But it really sums up our belief as we see it. He must increase. I must decrease. Uh, so again, John the Baptist is who spoke these words to his disciples uh, when in John 3.26, he was questioned. Okay, so John 3.26. He that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptism, all men come to him. John replied in John 27, or I'm sorry, in, uh, yeah, John 3.27. A man can receive nothing except it be given from him, from heaven, ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ. I am sent before him. So John the Baptist ended up having this really big following, right? But he was always quick to say, not me, him. He never wanted to take that credit. He was sent before to prepare the masses, but he never wanted that to get confused with who he was really preparing for, who he was really clearing the way for, if you will. So to start us on this journey, uh, like I said, I thought it'd be good to see who he was and why his saying he must increase and I must decrease was so significant because really what was so special about John, right? And by the way, if you haven't researched it before or looked into it like I had it, because I had it, uh, FYI, not a biblical scholar, I don't have this giant background in, in, in researching scripture or anything like that. I'm one of those that honestly was led to this church at a time in my life when I didn't know what to do. All I knew is I wasn't making the best decisions on my own, cried out to God. Um, God led me here to be perfectly honest. And so um, all that to say, when I research scripture, I end up getting really excited uh, and, and I start coming across things. And I'm like, no way. And then it's like, way. And it's like, oh, wow. Um, so, so as I go through this, if I get a little antsy, I get a little excited, please understand it's because it, it, it was all, you know, really something to me. Uh, so as we begin, let's see here for starters, this is, this is kind of neat. I thought this was pretty cool. I didn't, I didn't know this. A lot of y'all probably do. I didn't. So for starters, if you didn't know it, in Luke 136, it confirms John and Jesus, they were cousins. Did, any, did y'all know that? I mean, they were related. See, I didn't know this. Now, to y'all that have probably attended church for longer and maybe done more research, you're probably aware of it. I didn't know that. So John and Jesus are actually cousins. 
Uh, and the way that it reads, and this is also, this also excited me. Sorry. These words are spoken by Gabriel, the angel Gabriel. I just, that's really cool to me. Uh, so anyway, and, and it goes in 136, and behold, thy cousins Elizabeth, uh, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this was being spoken to Mary. So this is being spoken to Mary from Gabriel. So in addition to this, the birth or even the pregnancies were miraculous. I don't know if y'all knew that or not. So obviously, you know, we are all familiar with Jesus and the fact that that was an immaculate conception, right? Like we, all of us know that. We hear that all the time. So what I didn't realize is that it could almost be argued in a sense um, that the birth of John was immaculate in some way, right? So the way that it, the, the, the reason I think that and I'm getting a little bit of ahead of myself. You know, like I said, I get a little excited. Uh, so now if we could, if I could guide us to Luke, Luke 1, 6 through 7. And for reference, because I think reference is always a big thing when reading scripture. So for reference, this is Zacharias uh, and Elizabeth. And those are who's going to be John's parents, okay? So that's just for reference. So Luke 1, 6 through 7. Zacharias and Elizabeth were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they both were well stricken in years. Okay. So you've got a woman that's barren, right? Can't conceive at all. And then they're both well along in age. So no way for them to have kids, right? But God, um, so they couldn't conceive Elizabeth's barren, both advanced in age, just no way for this to happen, but God. Uh, so as I read through, I come to Luke 1, 8 through 12. Um, and this is Zacharias. And, and if I can summarize just a little bit, uh, he, was, he held a priest's office and he was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. So here he is. He's in the temple. Okay. He's burning incense, just kind of hanging out, right? Everybody else is outside praying. Zacharias got the incense burning. He's sitting there. I kind of see it this way. Zacharias here, he's burning, burning incense. And all of a sudden, behold, an angel of the Lord. So, ah, right? Because I, I'm sorry, but if I'm sitting there and all of a sudden an angel just pops up beside me, I don't care who you are. There's going to be a jump scare, okay? I, I mean, I feel like there would be because, so as I was writing this, I thought, okay, so I'm sitting in my office uh, and, I, and I'm, I'm taking my notes and I'm like, if I was just sitting here and all of a sudden I look next to me and there's an angel of the Lord, yeah, I'm probably going to jump a little bit. Um, so anyway, I just, I like to kind of point that out. Uh, so there he is, he's in the temple, he's burning the incense, there appears the angel. And also I want to point out, got excited here again, also Gabriel. Gabriel's kind of a big thing. Uh, so to continue on, so in Luke 1.12, it does go on to say, and when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, as you might imagine, uh, and fear did fall upon him. But the angel said unto him, fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John pretty specific instructions coming from Gabriel, right? And I mean, again, now, after the jump scare was over, if the angel is speaking to me and he tells me things, I'm probably going to believe it. Like, oh, okay, well, here's this angel from the Lord. And yeah, I'm going to go ahead and take what you have to say to heart and totally believe what you're saying. So as we go uh, on to Luke 1, 14, and thou shalt have joy and gladness and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall turn to the Lord, their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I'm Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and 
am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. So again, I kind of look back at this again, jump scare angel. But once the angel starts talking to you and the angel's telling you, hey, this is what's going to come to pass. Are you going to doubt the angel? Like, are you going to go, oh, okay, sure. You came down from heaven. You're here next to me. You appeared out of nowhere. I'm not going to believe the words that you're speaking to me. I'm going to ask you, hey, how am I going to know that though? How, how am I going to know what? Like, I, I, I just told you. I, I said it to you. So I'm always surprised that throughout Scripture, when people don't believe in what's being told to them, when it comes from an angel, like, how does that even happen? I, I don't know. I just, maybe it's just me. Uh, so then to summarize, in Luke one twenty, in my opinion, I think that Gabriel was like, oh, okay, okay, all right. So you don't believe me. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and stricken you with dumbness and you're going to be unable to speak when you leave the temple. Oh, and you're not going to be able to speak any of these things until they're actually performed. So you re- you receive this message from this angel, but you immediately doubt the angel and you're questioning the angel about how could these things be true? She's barren. I'm stricken in age. It can't come to pass. And the angel's like, <laughs> all right, cool. So now you're not going to be able, able to talk of the things that I told you about. And when you leave the temple, you're just going to be dumb. So when I was reading through, he, he comes out of the temple and sure enough, <laughs> the guy can't talk. He makes all these symbols and signs to people. And it's like, we, we, have, we don't know what you're talking about. We have no idea. Uh, so it goes on in Luke one twenty one, And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. Uh, tarried mean he took a long time. He was in there for a while. I had to look up the definition of that. Uh, and when he came out, he couldn't speak unto them. And they perceived he had seen a vision in the temple, and he made signs to them, but remained unable to speak. Uh, It goes on to confirm Elizabeth did become pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. Uh, And this is Elizabeth speaking. uh, And this is in, uh, so Luke... Believe it is Luke one twenty five. Uh, the Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, He has shown His favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. So, you know, they they were without children, and and she was barren, and here here she is, the miracle of birth. So now she's going to be blessed with a son. So, as Gabriel had foretold, she did become pregnant with John. Even though she was barren, even though they were well along in years, God's will was done as it, as it always is. In Luke 176, and for reference, this is Zacharias speaking, speaking or prophesying actually as it was written, uh, and thou child shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So now we know how John came to be, and we know who he was called to be. He was the one sent to start making the way for Jesus. So here he is. He's supposed to be teaching everyone that, hey, You know, this guy, Jesus, is coming, so he's basically trying to prepare the hearts and the minds to receive what will be. So now let's look to Matthew 3.1. So in Matthew 3.1, it says, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, uh, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Hesias saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his remnant of, this, this, this kind of throws me off a little bit, but it talks about he had camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. So John was a little, uh, I mean, you know, a little, little different than the rest. I mean, it's locusts and wild honey for John, right? So I, I just, I thought that was interesting. Um, <laughs> then he went out uh, to him, Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. In Matthew 3, 11, and this is John speaking, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, 
whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So again, I always go back to the fact that he never tried to take the credit like he was it. He was always paving the way for him who was to come, who was Jesus. And again, his cousin, I still think that's really neat that they they were family and here he is preparing the way. Uh, So now... Here comes the man of the hour, too sweet to be sour. That's right, it is Jesus. It is Jesus. In Matthew 3.13, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Are y'all following that? It's, It's Jesus. Jesus is coming to John to say, Hey, I want that uh that water baptismal that you're handing out here, right? And John, John's just like, uh, what? Like, you want me to baptize you, but, uh... And the way it goes is he says, but John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he suffered him. So definitely... John pushed back and was like, I don't know if I'm really qualified to baptize you. And Jesus is like, yeah, you are. And we've got to do it because we're going to make all things righteous. We're going to fulfill prophecy. So you're just going to have to go through with this and just do it. Trust me. Um, And so he did. Um, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So ultimately, John is sent into the world to pave the way for Jesus and what was to come. John began the the water baptismals and continued to do so. Again, I think that it's really neat that John even baptized Jesus himself. I think it's neat that they were cousins. I think it's neat that the angel Gabriel comes to speak to them. You know, Gabriel had also spoken to Mary. So it kind of like they had a family tradition kind of thing going on, but I mean, it's just, it's, it's really, it's really neat to me. And I also just kind of want to say this, um, so as I was trying to prepare this message this week and, and doing the, the scripture research, it seemed like there was just distraction after distraction as I went along, right? The moment that you try to step into it, it seems like these distractions, they come and they try to pull you away from it. And, and there were moments when it did. But for me, I kept leaning back on, but what am I researching? What am I researching? Well, I'm researching scripture, but more specifically, I'm researching John 3.30. He must increase and I must decrease. So for me this week, that meant putting some of the troubles that I had in my mind behind me and knowing that he was greater. It wasn't that I was going to create this amazing message whether it's good or not, it, it, it's going to be what came from God because of what he was able to fill me up with in order to pour out. And so I just continue to think about John 3.30, he must increase and I must decrease. So again, try to put all of the things that were going on in my personal life behind me, beside me, and let him increase and know that, but God, because he is greater than we. And, uh, you know, that's, the bulk of my message today. That was the the research that I got to do. And again, I felt honored to be able to do so. And I I hope that some of you learned from it. I don't know. I mean, for me, a lot of it was new information because I'd never looked into John before. I I didn't know that they were cousins, didn't know they were family, didn't know any of these things. Um, But it was a a great study for me. and, And I hope that some of you learned something from it today.